Okay. Stop. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I started recording. <laughs> You're on. Hello, and thank you for joining me for this presentation on harmful roadside invasive species. Uh, my name is Brittany Legale. I'm a member of Danby's Conservation Advisory Council and a uh, terrestrial plant specialist with the Finger Lakes Institute and Finger Lakes PRISM, which stands for Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. Um, we are your local or your regional, I guess, uh, go-to experts on invasive species, uh, outreach, education, and management. Um, so if you ever have any questions about uh, invasive species or um, need like outreach materials, uh, please get a hold of us at Finger Lakes Prism and I'll give you our email address uh, later in the show. Okay, so I thought we'd start by defining exactly what an invasive species is. Um, an invasive species is a non-native species that is capable of causing one or more of the following, economic harm, environmental harm, or harms human health. Uh, so here on the left, we see an example of harms human health. That's a chemical burn caused by giant hogweed, which we'll go over extensively in this presentation. Uh, the middle picture is an example of economic harm. That's kudzu eating someone's outbuilding. And then on the far right, that's an example of environmental harm. That is mass hemlock die off in the Great Smoky Mountain National Forests caused by the invasive pest hemlock woolly adelgid, which unfortunately is in our region. Uh, so here is an image of invasive species densities throughout the US. Um, as you can see, New York has more invasive forest pests than any other state, owing largely to our very active international shipping ports. Um, cargo ships and the materials they transport often harbor aquatic and terrestrial invasive species that then make it inland and spread from there. So how do invasive species spread? Uh, once here, invasive species are spread through some natural processes such as the movement of wind, water, and wildlife, um, especially birds who consume the seeds of invasive plants and deposit them in environments that are favorable for their establishment, such as roadsides and forest edges and openings. To an equal or greater extent, invasive species are also spread by human activities, uh, such as intentional planting. It's estimated that I think 56% of our terrestrial invasive plants uh, started off as popular landscaping plants. Uh, they spread through the mowing of plants that are in seed or vegetables. Uh, the use of fill dirt that's contaminated with invasive seeds, roots, or cuttings. The movement seeds or cuttings on vehicles, boots, or other equipment. Uh, so this movement was and open for colonization by invasive species and the creation and maintenance of utility right of ways, roads, and other corridors. Uh, for the purposes of this discussion, we're gonna focus on mowing and the use of contaminated fill dirt as mechanisms for the spread of invasive plants. So these are our suggestions for avoiding the spread of invasive species within the town. Uh, these suggestions fall into two general categories. One involves proactively cleaning gear and equipment, and the other is a suggestion of activities to avoid. We do recognize that the former is more time consuming and labor intensive than the latter, <clears throat> but do encourage all highway departments to take precautions to the greatest extent that they are able. So when you're working on or near a site that contains invasive plants, especially invasive knotweed, which we will go over in the following slides, and any invasives with seeds, uh, on the plants. We recommend cleaning gear, equipment, especially digging equipment, boots, and tire treads before leaving the site. Uh, we strongly recommend timing mowing so that it occurs before invasive plants like wild parsnip, which is increasingly common along roads in Danby, are going to seed. Um, knotweed is also increasingly common in Danby. It's incredibly hard to eradicate and causes extensive damage to private property. It spreads mostly through mowing and the movement of soil infested with knotweed roots. 
We recommend cleaning mowing equipment after cutting that weed and not moving soil from locations where that weed is present. So these are images of invasive knotweed. I'm sure you've all seen it uh, along the roadside. It's also commonly uh, known as bamboo, although it's not actually related to bamboo. Uh, it is almost impossible to kill. Its roots are capable of growing 10 feet deep and 65 feet laterally. And while it does go to seed, its seeds are almost entirely sterile. So it spreads aggressively through root fragments and stem cuttings, which is why move, mowing it and moving the soil from which it grows is so ill-advised. On the bottom left, you can see an example of knotweed leaves. And then moving clockwise, uh, you can see the thick stem with prominent, no prominent nodes, which is characteristic of knotweed, uh, the white flowers, uh, the small white uh, seeds, and then the uh, right below the seeds is what knotweed looks like overwintering. Those uh, stems turn a reddish color. And then on the far right, you can see examples of knotweed that has taken over stream banks. Uh, they really like wet riparian areas and their roots encourage erosion and sedimentation of the waterway. And these are images of the damage that knotweed can do to infrastructure. So here you can see it growing through concrete, asphalt, and tarmac. Um, and then on the uh, bottom right, you can see knotweed growing up through someone's floorboards uh, after it is broken through their foundation. Um, I'm not sure why this plant and the damage it can cause isn't taken more seriously in the US. But in the UK, you cannot mortgage your house if you have this growing on your property or within about 75 feet of the property line. A bank will not finance a loan on your property uh, because the root system is so serious. I don't know of any other plant that can do this. Um, it's a shame that it's here, but it's become pretty ubiquitous. Okay, so now we'll move on to plants that can cause chemical burns. We'll cover two species in this section. Uh, the first is giant hogweed, which you can see here. And we'll go over identification and characteristics of the species a little later on in the presentation. Uh, the second plant is wild parsnip, which you can see here. Um, they're from the same family. The wild parsnip obviously has yellow flowers. Um, and is much smaller than the giant hogweed, but both, oops, yeah, both can cause chemical burns. Okay, so here's an example of the damage that they can do. Um, so both these species contain um, a chemical sap that binds to DNA and basically prevents the skin and the DNA from protecting itself from ultraviolet light. Uh, causing what we call phototoxic reaction. So all parts of both plants contain this chemical sap, which is released when the plant is damaged or broken. The chemical burn is activated by sunlight. It feels like being burned on a hot stove and tends to set in 15 minutes to two hours after contact. Heat and moisture, like sweat, can worsen these effects and spread the sap uh, further along your skin. Uh, this burn can cause permanent scarring, though it usually goes away in a matter of years. Um, and you will need to keep the skin protected from sunlight for a number of years because the burn will reactivate when exposed to light for months to years, depending on how badly you're burned and your own genetic predisposition to, to the damage. So to protect yourself, we recommend first that you learn to identify these plants so you can avoid contacting them, that you never touch them with your bare skin, uh, that you wear protective waterproof clothing from head to toe if you ever have to work around these plants, including eye protection, because this can also cause blindness, uh, that you wash yourself with soap and water after working near these plants, and I should note that giant hogweed in particular is capable of shooting sap up to four feet from the uh, usually the main stem when it's broken. So if you're working around these plants with a crew, uh, removing them, you'll want to be sure to know where your coworkers are so that you can avoid harming them. 
So what do you do if you do contact the sap? Um, it's important to cover the area immediately to protect it from sunlight to prevent that reaction from happening and wash with soap and water as soon as possible. Uh, these are examples of the um, wash basins that the DC crews have with them at all times. <clears throat> and they contain water, soap, and eye wash. Uh, they have them at their vehicle if they're working roadside. If they're working 15 minutes or more from the vehicle, then they take a field kit with them containing water, soap, and eye wash. Um, after washing, you'll need to protect the skin from sunlight for at least 48 hours. And if you do get a reaction, you will have to keep the affected area out of the sun for years to prevent the bird from reactivating. Um, if the reaction is very severe and causes you undue comfort, or discomfort, you can see a physician to get prescription steroids. Uh, so now we'll quickly cover giant hogweed identification and the DEC's giant hogweed control program. Uh, giant hogweed is an invasive plant from Eurasia that was first brought to a botanical garden in Rochester as an impressive botanical specimen, and it has spread from there. Uh, it tends to spread quickly out along roadsides and waterways where it forms dense stands that outcompete native vegetation and cause soil erosion, in addition to being hazard to human health. And it is against New York state law to knowingly possess, transport, or propagate this plant. Uh, the DC has a statewide control program aimed at eradicating giant hogweed. That's unlike basically any other invasive species uh, because it's so potentially hazardous to human health. So this is a map of active control sites. Uh, you can see from this map that the infestation is most dense near the Rochester area and has spread from there. Yellow dots indicate sites with less than 400 plants. Red dots indicate sites with more than 400 plants. And blue dots indicate sites where hogweed has been eradicated, but the DEC is still monitoring. Um, there are currently just shy of 1,900 active sites. This is the contact information for the Giant Hogweed Control Program. You can call or email to report new sites, get help with identification, ask questions about control, and request assistance from the program. The DEC provides free assistance to property owners and localities in controlling giant hogweed. Uh, infestations of less than 400 plants are dealt with manually, so root cutting, uh, pulling plants, things like that. Sites with more than 400 plants are controlled chemically. So using a systemic uh, herbicide like glyphosate. The DEC will continue to treat and monitor sites for three years after the last plant has been observed to ensure that the infestation has been eliminated. The property owner's explicit permission is always required each year before the DEC enters the property. So there are no surprise visits. And likewise, property owners have to consent to each treatment that is administered. Here are examples of DEC crews at work. The top left is a crew member cutting roots. Top right is chemical application of glyphosate to leaves. And bottom right is a crew member cutting an inflorescence before it goes to seed. The best time to control giant hogweed is when the plants are small and before they go to seed. As always, it's important not to mow plants that have gone to seed to avoid spreading them along the roadside. And this is an example of a successful DEC control project. After three years of chemical treatment, giant hogweed was significantly reduced behind the school, um, as shown in these before and after photos. In 2008, there were over 10,000 plants growing uh, at this location, and by 2018, that number had been reduced to just 14 plants. This map shows about 1,500 sites where giant hogweed has been successfully eliminated by DEC control crews. Uh, the purple dots indicate sites where giant hogweed is confirmed to have been completely eliminated. Blue dots are sites where no plants are present, but that are still being monitored by the DEC. So now we'll quickly go over giant hogweed identification. 
If you've never seen this plant in person, it is a rather impressive plant when mature, up to 14 feet tall, with leaves up to five feet across, and a white flower umbel that's about two and a half feet across. So when fully mature, can't really be mistaken for many other plants. There are two native lookalikes, um, especially uh, when plants are immature and a bit shorter than their full mature height. So at the top right, you can see Angelica that has that completely rounded flower uh, umbel, uh, unlike the giant hogweed, which has a flat topped umbel. And then cow parsnip, which is the closest lookalike, um, generally has um, 15 to 30 flower rays. So those are those stems coming off the flower umbel, whereas giant hogweed will have more than 50. And perhaps an easier diagnostic tool is that giant hogweed has a green hairy stem with purple blotches. The angelica has a solid purple stem and the cow parsnip has a solid green stem that is hairy. So if you see a blotchy purple hairy stem, you can suspect that it's giant hogweed. These are seedlings that have just emerged. Uh, at this stage, giant hogweed can be mistaken for many, many other plants. So here's a slightly older leaf. And here the leaflet has begun to divide. And this is a mature leaf, uh, about five feet wide and over six feet tall, or long, I suppose. This is a flower block. Uh, flower bud, you can see it's blotched with purple. And here is a mature plant and flower. Giant hogweed is a biennial, which means each individual plant only lives for two years. So the first year it doesn't flower at all. The second year it flowers and once it sets seed, the plant dies back to the ground. Each plant is capable of producing tens of thousands of seeds with about 20,000 seeds being average. And as you can see from this photo, that central flower umbel will shed its petals and go to seed first before the satellite umbels. And here is a plant that is completely gone to seed. This is a second year plant that was ready to flower, but was mowed. So it still had enough energy in the root to flower and then set seed. Mowed plants can be harder to identify because they lack that impressive stature that's typical of giant hogweed. So they can be more dangerous because of course they're still filled with those chemicals. And finally, this is what giant hogweed looks like in the late fall and through the winter after it has died back. And this slide details how to report giant hogweed. You can email, call, or text the program with directions to the site an estimated number of plants and decent photos of the plants. Um, we'll end with a slide that goes over this information so you can write it down then. Now we'll very briefly go over wild parsnip. It's also an invasive plant from Eurasia that prefers open fields and roadsides. It also degrades native ecosystems by forming dense stands that outcompete native plants and is a human health hazard. It is widespread new in New York and in the town of Danby, especially along roadsides. So as I mentioned, wild parsnip also causes chemical burns as shown in these photos. Uh, as you might infer from the splash pattern, both of these people were burned with wild parsnip sap while attempting to use weed trimmers on the plant. Wild parsnip is also a biennial, so it grows as a low leafy plant the first year, then it bolts, growing four to five feet tall the second year. The stem is smooth, green, and deeply ribbed. The leaf is compound, meaning it's deeply divided into many leaflets, like the giant hogweed leaf, although obviously much smaller. And wild parsnip begins to flower from late May to uh, through June. and flowers for about two months before setting seed, which typically occurs in August or September. It has flat topped comp compound umbels that are composed of yellow flowers. So it's always going to be yellow. 
because wild parsnip is so widespread, there's no statewide control program. Um, if you would like to control it yourself, we recommend eliminating wild parsnip by cutting the roots or pulling the plants. Um, you can also prevent further establishment by removing and disposing of the flowers and seed heads. Uh, you can frequently mow the plants before they have gone to seed, um, or you can spray them with a systemic chemical herbicide like glyphosate. Best time to initiate control efforts is early in the season when plants are still small and they can be easily mowed. As always, it is important not to mow plants after they have gone to seed as this will spread them along the roadside, infesting neighboring properties and exacerbating the problem. And of course, you'll want to wear protective equipment even if the plants are short and you're mowing them. So waterproof pants and um, shoes and all that. And while there is no statewide control program, you can reach out to the DC's giant hogweed control program for more information and advice on managing wild parsnip. Uh, Finger Lakes Prism is also here to provide support for invasive species management in the Finger Lakes. We can provide outreach materials on invasive plant and animal species and can provide your department with brochures and posters if you'd like. Um, you can just contact me and I can drop off uh, those materials at your convenience. You can also help by reporting infestations to IMAP invasives. Um, because of the damage to human health uh, that these plants cause, there are volunteer groups who target wild parsnip and they can use this information to um, better inform their efforts. And finally, I just wanted to show you all images of spotted lanternfly, which is a new invasive insect that was first reported in the Finger Lakes in Ithaca last fall. Uh, where intensive, extensive control efforts, <clears throat> excuse me, are now underway to ensure it doesn't spread. It feeds on grapevines as well as trees, is incredibly difficult to control, and poses an existential threat to one of the biggest economic engines in our region. The top left image shows adult spotted lanternflies laying egg masses, which start off white and then age to a gray color. They appear um, as parallel rows of eggs that are covered by muddy substance. <clears throat> the bottom left are immature larval stages. So the insect starts off black with white spots and they're about a quarter of an inch long. And then they shed several exoskeletons before developing these red splotches and growing to about three quarters of an inch long. The image in the center is a mature pregnant female and the image on the right is damage to a tree that's indicative of spotted lanternfly. So the insects feed on the sugary sap flowing through the tree, um, what we call phloem, basically veins, and they excrete a sugary honeydew, which attracts mold. So that's a telltale indicator of spotted lanternfly. So if you see that, um, you can report it to New York Ag and Markets. They recently took over the control program from the DEC because it's such a huge threat to our agricultural industry. Um, so you can report to spotted lanternfly at agriculture.newyork.gov, take pictures of the insect or egg masses or infestation signs, whatever you're seeing. Uh, it's helpful if you include something for scale, like a coin or a ruler. And you'll want to note the location by providing an address, a road intersection, landmarks, or even better GPS coordinates. Um, instead of uh, emailing, you can also fill out the reporting form, which can be found at agriculture.newyork.gov backslash, backslash spotted lanternfly and just click on the take action tab and it'll send you a link. It'll show you a link to that reporting form. So then on the left there is the giant hogweed inf uh, control program information. And uh, that's that will conclude my presentation. Uh, are there any questions on any of this? Well, let me unmute the, um, Laura so that she can ask the questions. Now, Laura, you're going to unmute yourself.
Can you hear us? Yep. Okay. That was a good presentation, Brittany. That was interesting. Oh, thank you. There's a lot of different things you didn't know. As a matter of fact, we picked up on a kind of a safety tip to do for our men to make sure that uh, we have those kits of washing in their trucks that I don't think we have. But, you know, we now that we know that this is a little bit more about this being in the area, that uh, is something we need to do. So that was helpful. Yeah, those burns can be really nasty. And wild parsnip is all over the place around here. Yeah. Yeah, because we want to make sure that everybody's protected and these guys are protected against all these kinds of things. And when you see those nasty burns, when you see those nasty burns on the TV, did you guys ever get one of those nasty burns? Yeah. yeah. These? Have you really? It's not on the parts of that Oh, did you? Yeah. Usually, so, if I, if I uh, trim it, I want to also take a shower. Yeah. yeah. But you've had a burn on there from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of those plants yeah. before at home. Well, the mower, it, it kills the seeds, so we get that stuff more. Oh, yeah, keep up with it. Yeah, it's something I keep mowing it. Go so, away. what's the time? What's the time of year when you should mow that so it doesn't go to seed? Remember. Is it, is it, you know, right is now. it in the spring? Mode? Right now. Right now, before it goes? Oh, well, no, what I'm saying yeah. is if you mow it now, uh -huh. the flowers don't get on to it. There you go. So if you mow it now, you won't get the you won't get the flowers, you won't get the seed. It kills it, it'll kill it off if you just keep up mowing. You guys know where there's any of it that you guys uh, seen it out there? It's on a lot of places. I can't right. believe how tall it gets. Uh -huh. I yeah, think it's as tall as me. <laughs> you know, with the with the mower we have now that you can't extend across the ditch, you know, you can't keep that ditch line clean. The only one we have is great elbow. The great elbow does a lot of other things besides. You know, you just can't keep the braid on, braid, braid on mowing. You got to, we had a, you know, a boom on the tractor. You can do the bank and on the other side of the bank, and you would get rid of a lot of this shit. Maybe both sides of the ditch. Right? Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, well. One thing I've observed from having it in my yard is that if you mow it early, it has a, it has a chance to grow back and then reflower. So it's actually best to mow it just before it goes into flower, or when it's or, or early in bloom, and then it, and then it's yeah, it's yeah. too late for it to come back. <laughs> but if the roots are still there, if the roots are still there, will it just grow up again next year? Yeah. No, because as Brittany pointed out, it's a biennial, so it only it only lives for two years. The I, first year, the first year it produces a rosette, you know, a, a, a cluster of leaves at the base, and the second year it shoots up into flower. It's kind of like burdock. Burdock does the same thing, and burdock is also biennial. And if you if you cut it down when it's in bloom, um, then 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 it it gradually dies out because it just, if it doesn't get to mature its seeds, the plant itself will die after after it blooms. And if there's no no uh, seeds out around, the, the you, you, it quickly depletes the seeds because the seeds only. Brittany, you know how long the seeds last without uh, you know before they 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 die just from not being able to grow you mean like the residency time in the soil like how long can they how long does the seed last before you deplete it um so i know that the seeds can lie dormant in the soil for just a couple years um the seeds will stay on the plant generally through the early winter sure um but if you if you do start mowing early and you mow frequently enough you can deplete the root system so sure. if your if your only option is to use a mower on like a large patch, I would recommend keeping them short rather than trying to mow once they're mature because you'll increase your chances of the skin contact with the sap. Yeah, the problem is the highway departments typically don't mow that frequently. How often yeah. how often do we mow our roadsides? Well, a couple of times we we have mowed them twice a year. And, it, and, and when are those times? Like right about now, we usually do it now between now and the 4th of July. And then sometimes if we get out, we do it, you know, August. late August to October. Yeah, so I don't. When does this thing bloom, Brittany? It uh, blooms in May and June, and then it goes to seed uh, in August and September generally. 
Yeah, yeah. but if you keep it mowed off, it can't it can't go to seed. Right, exactly. Yeah, if you frequently mow it, yeah. Yeah, if you mow it uh, just when it has gone to flower, um, if the timing's right, it won't have time to maximize. Right, so when it's sh shooting up its flower stock would be probably the best time if you're only going to do it once. Yeah. Can you guys identify like certain areas where it's worse? Like well, identify like five areas or something where you see it the most? Well, that place over there. Once it comes I up, I've seen over it. on Miller Road, it's terrible over there. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, Miller Road's Road is the one they want uh, no mowing because of wild. Well, well she died, so we got to worry about well, that. Did she? Yeah, I didn't know that. She passed away, so we don't have to worry about that. We can just mow. Perfect. <laughs> so it would be good to identify some certain areas then maybe so we just keep mowing those areas more frequently yeah i saw it last year i just I worked around so much i don't pay attention to it anymore another thing that Brittany didn't mention but i i found it to be the case myself is depending on your diet your your susceptibility to fo to the photosensitivity is affected so if you have a lot of antioxidants in your diet you're less likely to get a bad burn from it huh. yeah, great, man. <laughs> that's a that's a plug for a good diet. <laughs> <laughs> have we have we ever had any hot, giant hogweed spotted in Danby? Uh there was a patch, I think it was somewhere near the Danby State Forest. Um, that was a few years ago, though. I, I didn't personally see it myself. I don't really remember exactly where it was. No. I know there was a patch in Danby that was being treated by the DCs. No. Yeah. Well, there's some on that. Did you hear that, Brittany? The guys? No, I didn't. These guys can really, they've been, a lot of the people who've been here for a long time, they can tell you exactly where all this stuff is. They That's what they're talking about. We're just talking about right now that we have some on almost every road into really that they see the giant hogweed? not the giant hogweed no the parsnips are all over the place parsnip, yeah if, okay if you can uh put those locations into that um new york imap invasives.com that can help you target the mowing you can reference that um because it'll you know you can bring that up and, and reference it as a tool Okay, of course we have we have uh, knotweed all over the place. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so the knotweed grows and it becomes a, a problem for sight in some areas and corners. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And that, that becomes a safety issue for traffic. Right. Yeah, because it'll grow right up like to the roadside because it doesn't really need any soil to grow. What happens if you weed spray it when it's early? Um, so there, there are methods that have been developed uh, to control it. Like I said, it's almost impossible to eradicate. You have to be really consistent and targeted. But um, the best advice I've seen is to early spring come back to deplete some of its energy. And then in fall, after it's gone to flower, to cut it again and then hit the um, cut stalks with glyphosate because it's at that point in the late fall, it's pulling all of its energy down to its roots. So if you can hit the cut stalks with the glyphosate, it'll take the glyphosate down to its roots. I just thought maybe it didn't need spray. So what is, it, what is the highway department supposed to do if it's in a ditch and you need to clean a ditch? Um, I would just recommend, like I said, it's really hard to eradicate. Um, so I would just recommend, you know, I understand that like, uh, like these things can be labor intensive and that, you know, budgets are restricted, but best practices would be to clean up the stems that they've cut and bag them and uh, dispose of them in a landfill. Um, so that those cuttings don't spread. Does it, it, it have a program to help 
Was it a problem around areas that are a problem for safety? Uh, and that was not weed, just with the uh, just with the giant hog weed. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know why it's not taken more seriously uh, in this country. Uh, in other countries, it, it's quite a serious issue because of the effect it can have on infrastructure and private property. Un unlike uh, unlike the uh, parsnips, you can eat them. Yeah, you can't eat them. <laughs> I think you can eat the parsnips too. It's just the top that's, that makes you photosensitive, right? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I've never been uh, been curious enough to try it. <laughs> it's my understanding that the the, the uh, Japanese knot we could be eating like asparagus. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard it's kind of tasty. It's not an effective control method, but I mean, no. you know, <laughs> if you have it, you might as well. <laughs> you guys got any more questions or anything? No. Okay, thanks for every, all your help. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you for being here. Um, hope you guys have a great day. And uh, whoever was working on High Z today, thanks for that. The road looks great. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, yeah. What about yeah, yesterday? Everybody. <laughs> 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 this is a good group here. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you